Now we'll briefly introduce OpenCL and its significance in designing FPGA-based applications. Why we want to design OpenCL programs on FPGAs? Traditionally, there are a lot more programmers for standard CPUs than the programmers for FPGAs. Partly because for FPGA development, you need to know details about FPGA resources and have significant skills in logic design. The advantage of OpenCL as a high-level programming language, it expands the number of application developers for FPGAs. OpenCL allows the FPGA engineers to use software engineering resources to take advantage of the parallel computing resources on FPGAs. Specifically, Intel FPGA using OpenCL to abstract away FPGA hardware flow by bringing the FPGA to low-level software programmers. So software developers can write, optimize, and debug OpenCL program in a very familiar environment. At the back end, Quota's software will run behind the scenes, perform the design flow and optimizations. With the emulator and profiler tools, software programmers can design, debug, and optimize FPGA applications. So what is OpenCL? OpenCL is a software programming model for software engineers and a software methodology for system architects. It is an industry standard for heterogeneous computing. Within OpenCL, programmers can use familiar C or C++ APIs to write programs for host side. Also, they can use OpenCLC to write programs for executing complex workloads on hardware accelerators. These accelerators can be multi-core processors, GPUs, and FPGAs. And with this low-level programming language, the programmers can leverage the hardware resources using familiar software interface and APIs. It is open, royalty-free, and it is a standard supported by multiple vendors. OpenCL is managed by Kronos Group, and Intel is an active member of the group. It has evolved from 1.0 to right now 2.0 uh, in its current OpenCL specification. The big idea behind OpenCL is its execution model. With OpenCL, we can define n-dimensional computational domain. Then we can execute a kernel at each point in a computational domain. Let's look at this example. If we want to multiply two vectors, we can use this for loop to perform element-wise multiplication. Although we know the multiplication of these each, each of the individual element pairs can be done in parallel, but this parallelism is not specified in this for loop. That's why we say in the traditional design, the parallelism must be inferred. In contrast, we can use OpenCL kernel, we can design a multiplication where the computation of these element-wise multiplication are done in parallel. Specifically, this kernel function takes three arguments, two input vectors and an output vector. Within this kernel, we'll use this API, getGlobalID, to find the index to this vector pairs. And then we perform the multiplication on just these two elements and then assign the product to the output element. And because we define such a kernel function, we can execute this kernel over n work items. And in this way, we'll specify how a small task are performed across multiple data elements. In this way, the parallelism 
is explicitly specified. Uh, we want to show you an OpenCL programming model using example where we have code on the host side and also the kernel function on the device side. By the way, we have two main hardware domains for an OpenCL framework, host and accelerator or device. We have programs running on the host side, which prepares the devices and the kernels, created commands as needed to, to be submitted to these devices. In this example, we have a main program on the host side. We have several subtasks, read data and manipulate data, and then we'll send the input data to the device by using CL in queue write buffer. And then we will create kernels to execute these kernel functions using API CL in queue and derange kernel. And after the computation is done, we'll do CL in queue read buffer to retrieve the computation result. On the device side, we have a kernel function that's defined in OpenCLC. And when the CL in queue and the range kernel is executed on the host, that will trigger multiple instances of this kernel function to be executed on its compute units on the device. As you can see, the host application and the accelerator code are separate. The host program is pure software written in standard C or C++. The host communicates with the accelerator device through a set of OpenCL API calls, which abstract the communication between the host processor and the kernels executed on the device. As we showed earlier, we have an API called CL in queue write buffer, which copies data from the host to FPGA. And then we have CL in queue and derange kernel, which will ask the FPGA to run a particular kernel. Once the computation is done, we'll then copy data from the FPGA to host. OpenCL kernels are data parallel functions. We use OpenCL kernels to define many parallel threads of execution. Each of these threads or instance of the kernel execution will rely on identifiers specified by getGlobalID or in sometimes getLocalID. These IDs will help us to identify the segments or partitions of data that this particular kernel is supposed to work on. OpenCL kernel functions also contain keyword extensions to specify parallelism and memory hierarchy. Such as here in this example, underscore underscore global is a keyword to specify that this variable A, a memory object, resides in global memory. Kernels can be executed by a computer device. And these computer devices can be CPU, GPU, or FPGA. In this example, the way we design a kernel is we will first get a global ID, which retrieves the identifier of this kernel function. And we use this ID to index the corresponding element pairs in vector A and B and perform the addition. The result will be assigned to the output buffer answer using the same ID. So visually, what we're performing here is that we perform the element-wise sum on every element pair of A and B. And this addition operation is done in parallel because there's no dependency across these individual pairs. In other words, the sum of the pairwise elements are independent. We see from the previous example that each kernel function or each thread know its identifier. And it is used to determine which slices of data the thread or kernel function should work on. 
Through this way, we can use threads to access different pieces of data in the original data set. These threads are also partitioned into work groups. Only threads within one work group can share local memory. As we illustrated here, we have 15 threads, and five of them are grouped in a bundle, and first five threads are grouped into work group zero, and these five threads can share local memory. Likewise, the next five threads can share local memory, and then the final five threads will share local memory. We identify these threads using IDs, and we have local ID and global ID. If we look at global ID, and the identifier starts from zero, and the next thread is one, and so on, and up to 15, because we have 15 threads. Within each work group, we also have identifiers, and those are called local IDs. So among these five threads in work group zero, their local IDs are 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And likewise, the next five threads in work group 1 will have their IDs 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. We can easily observe that the global ID can be calculated using this formula. The group ID times the local size, which is the number of threads in a group, plus the local ID of that thread. 